So welcome to MRS Bulletin Society News. My name is Gopal Rao, and I'm the Chief Editor for Technical Content at the Materials Research Society, MRS, and the Editor of MRS Bulletin. I'm very pleased today to be talking with Dr. James Warren. Dr. Warren is with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, uh, where he's Director of the NIST Materials Genome Pro Program which is part of the Materials Genome Initiative. Uh, he's also one of the co-founders and the current director of the NIST Center for Theoretical and Computational Materials Science. So Jim, welcome and thanks very much for talking with, with me today. It's my pleasure. Um, now the Materials Genome Initiative or MGI is a federal US multi-agency initiative for discovering manufacturing and deploying advanced materials twice as fast um, and at a fraction of the cost compared to traditional methods. Uh, it was unveiled in June of 2011 by then US President Barack Obama's Office of Science and Technology Policy via a white paper called the Materials Genome Initiative for Global Competitiveness. It's now 10 years since MGI was announced. So um, maybe we'll start with um, uh, most of our viewers are familiar with MGI, but I was wondering if you could give a short introduction to MGI, and in particular, maybe talk a little bit about how the term genome originated in the name. That's great. Sure, I'd be happy to do that, and I'll try to do it quickly. Uh, I'm smiling because, of course, the word genome in the name has a history, uh, and of course, almost all of us didn't particularly care for the use of the word genome in the name when we were developing the white paper because it's a metaphor and, and scientists in general don't particularly care for metaphors. They like nice, precise uh, definitions. And so you know, we wanted the National Materials Initiative or something like that. But the White House wisely understood that everybody who wasn't an expert would sort of see the analogy between the Human Genome Initiative and something around materials uh, as just that, an analogy, and think they could probably just get it without having to do too much explaining it. And I think that was right. And so uh, we put in the white paper that people shouldn't take the analogy too seriously. Um, but the notion was that, uh, you know, you're building a base of knowledge, and then once you have that base, you can use it then to really push the boundaries of science forward in new ways, particularly as you accumulate uh, large amounts of uh, information. Uh, and so a lot of the MGI, and I'm sure we'll get into this, uh, in the end is around how do you manage information and knowledge uh, and things like that. There is a history as well in that uh, Garrett Steeter in the mid 2000s started something called the Materials Genome Project. And Tom Khalil, who was at the White House at the time, had seen that presentation and was very excited by it. And so I think that in the end was the kindling uh, that allowed them to come to the back to the National Science and Technology Council uh, and say, can we do something around these ideas? Uh, of course, the agencies, as much as we admire very much the efforts of the materials project or the materials genome project, realize it could be way bigger even than that. Uh, and so we see what you found in that white paper and now 10 years later. Uh, so in the 10 years since the MGI was announced, the white paper published, uh, what do you think has been achieved in the material space? Uh, and I was wondering if you could give specific examples of some of the successes, uh, both in terms of end results and also infrastructure and tools development. Sure. So it's a very great uh, question. It's a very hard question. Um, and so there's no way for me to do justice to all of the successes uh, that, you know, I'll be singling people out uh, and <laughs> it's just not fair. And, you know, I looked at the, that this question when you shared it with me earlier and I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do here. I will mention there was a paper in 2019 uh, that uh, Wanda Pablo and a large number of co-authors uh, across the sort of NGI spectrum pulled together. And I would encourage people to sort of Google that uh, and find it or reach out to me and I can give you the reference. Uh, which has just a laundry list of real successes, uh, you know, in the, everything, electronics, polymers, metals, ceramics, 
uh, so all of the sort of materials, subdisciplines, all of the new dis materials that have been discovered. Uh, and as you say, in some sense, the MGI is more of a meta initiative in that the point of the initiative is to accelerate the, this uh, discovery, design, development of new materials, not just make them, right? We know all of us who are in the materials space know how important it is uh, to make these materials, meet these targets. But the question is, can we make it easier? Can we make it faster? Can we integrate this stuff into manufacturing more? And so for that, we need this materials innovation infrastructure. And that's the core of the MGI. And you can now look around and see how the federal agencies really have focused more on dissemination of tools, creation of platforms, both experimental and computational uh, that have more user access and also enhancing this broader based collaborations perhaps than was more traditionally thought of so that you could get this a fuller range of uh, in, uh, integration. And so beyond just the simple single investigator idea, um, although that remains extremely important. Um, so I sort of dodged a little bit there, but that's because, as I said, <laughs> I was a little nervous about playing favorites. Um, but there is, you know, there's so much. Completely understand. So, um, and it's, it's very interesting and heartening to know about all of these successes. Um, and certainly the paper that you mentioned, uh, we will certainly reference that. Uh, now, of course, one big area today is artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, computational science, and data-driven material science. This broad area is seeing enormous advances in interest. Uh, we published your article in MRS Bulletin in June of 2018 on MGI and AI based on your plenary presentation at the 2017 MRS fall meeting. So uh, what role has MGI played in all of these AI related advances uh, that we're seeing today and over the past decade? Right, so that's a very specific way of thinking about it. So I'll see if I can get the framing on this right. What amazes me is that that talk that I gave now is almost four years ago. Um, and at the time, I would say, there was the community was split into the people who really saw that AI was really going to come up fast and uh, be very important and sort of take things by storm. And it wasn't just some kind of fad. Uh, and uh, a lot of very reasonable concern in the community because there are issues. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, it was, a, you know, it was a call to arms <laughs> uh, within the framework of the MGI. Uh, and, you know, we had anticipated, we'll give ourselves that much credit, the rise of data-driven science uh, back in 2013. Uh, but quite frankly, um, I didn't think it would happen myself as quickly as it suddenly did, right? That's the thing about exponentials. Uh, and I really believe we are in sort of an exponential kind of change here, which is essentially being driven by Moore's law again. So all of these things in some sense are traceable to that. Uh, in terms of how MGI has played a direct role in AI, that's a, a little bit uh, harder to pin down. I would say that as I argued in that presentation, MGI and the application of AI and machine learning techniques in general to materials problems are essentially in complete harmony. Uh, essentially, if you want to accelerate the discovery design of new materials, AI uh, machine learning is just a fantastic tool to do that. And since there's a huge focus on data management and on you know, curation and sharing of data, again, that's the fodder for AI algorithms. And so there's a lot of talk about AI-ready uh, data now and how do we do a better job of sharing it so that we can you know, synthesize data sets uh, you know, merge them in intelligent ways. How do we generate more data? How do we now, and we'll talk about this perhaps some more uh, autonomous systems that allow us to generate mass quantities of data over wide parameter ranges. Uh, that's all completely in scope within the MGI. And we are on the cusp of releasing our 2021 10 year strategic plan. And I think you'll find a lot of discussion of these issues uh, and their importance in that document when it comes out, hopefully very soon. Now you're a theorist. Um, where do you think theory fits into all of this? 
Ah, yes, right. Well, that's a great question. And, uh, and certainly when uh, I first started thinking about the application of AI, I was a little nervous as a theorist because it sounds at first like you're sort of mooting the need for theory. Uh, but of course, it's turned out to be precisely the opposite. And first of all, uh, you know, uh, AI uh, likely and, and already has exposed areas of ignorance, right? Where you find effectively correlations and you're like, what's going on there? And that's absolutely, you know, that's red meat for a theorist. Uh, you know, how can I explain this? How can I understand this better? How can we reduce this and make it explainable in, in some sense? Uh, that, you know, which is the heart of, of, of physics and theory in general is uh, getting beyond uh, correlation into to causation. Uh, and so in that sense, the theorist has an enormous role, but in a more practical sense, uh, when you're doing uh, these kinds of uh, methods, the some of the biggest open questions, and you'll see a lot of presentations on this now, have to do with how you fuse theory with machine learning uh, and other methods uh, so that you can reduce the search space, so that you can improve the quality of the machine learning results in some sense. Um, and, then, and so there are all of these issues, you know, how do you impose symmetry conditions and things like that. Uh, this is a fascinating and open topic of research that likely won't ever be answered. It will just have a variety of approaches uh, to, to address those issues. And so that's, just, I think, a lot, a lot of where the fun is, uh, both for the experimental efforts and the theoretical efforts, um, is sort of how do you constrain uh, these spaces and, and do better, better science. Very good. Um, and going back to MGI's original intent, um, from an industrial perspective, do you think that has been achieved? Um, are there maybe examples of new materials or manufacturing processes that have been developed using MGI that are used for uh, commercial products today? Yeah, so I love this question. Um, so have we achieved our goal or you know, original intent? Well, no. I mean, in the sense that there's still a lot of work to do, right? Uh, there's no way we're stopping now. And perhaps we'll talk about that a bit more. Uh, but certainly there are lots of success stories out there uh, that we uh, can point to. The, the, the thing that makes me a little nervous is uh, I don't want to necessarily take credit within some company that did some work. And I would say, oh, yes, it's because of the MGI that that company is so successful. No, I'm not, not going to say that. Uh, I, could cert I certainly have colleagues who have said to me in industry that the existence of the MGI allowed them to stand up programs within their companies that they would not have otherwise done because that they could sense the urgency that helped drive the management's decision to turn towards these methods perhaps more quickly. Um, and then you could also talk about the adoption uh, of these methods. I mean, if you're talking about, say, the semiconductor industry, which you have been reading about lately, uh, the, uh, these companies are using these techniques. They have to, right? This is, it's not an option. Uh, you know, you're designing things that now have late scales in the nanometers or literally atomic. Um, and, uh, you know, quantum effects are, are there. They have to model everything, right? Every atom, basically. Uh, and so if you're talking about uh, those kind of foundational uh, types of approaches, truly, uh, we can make enormous progress uh, with the MGI approach. But then you can also look at uh, some of the bigger companies that uh, I've talked about before. Apple is now very open about uh, how they do their alloy design. Tesla SpaceX is also talking about these things. Um, uh, uh, you know, of course, Quest Tech was sort of first to market with some of these techniques back in the mid 2000s. And so uh, we there's so much that's being done with these approaches where these companies and a lot of startups uh, as well uh, that have moved into this space and are partners in achieving the goals of the MGI. Uh, I mean, you, the, the goals of the MGI are enormous, right? We're really trying to do something hard that we know we have to do. And it's really all hands on deck. Uh, so in that sense, we're not done, but of course there are companies they're doing this. I'm sure we'll, we'll be seeing um, many more companies use all of the information that has come out 
of the uh, work that's been done so far and take it a whole lot further in the coming years. So uh, you talked about a strategic plan um, and I was wondering if you could sort of um, gaze into the crystal ball and tell us where MGI might be taking material science and technology over the next 10 years. Right, so beyond just sort of more of the same, um, you, you could certainly talk about how we're going to try to achieve a number of things. Uh, sort of this, this sort of more fundamental question around getting that integration of theory, computation, experiment, and the sort of old underlying data infrastructure to be as tight as possible, continuing to drive that down, drive the barriers down to access for information uh, as much as possible. Um, and, you know, all of the federal investments and strategy around that. Um, at the same time, there's a real acknowledgement that the data infrastructure itself really needs a, a very strong investment and a huge community effort to sort of figure out, I like to frame this in the following way. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about incentives for publishing data. In, in a certain sense, it's the fundamental problem. In, in, and it's not interesting in some sense, because people say, I don't have an incentive to publish my data. And they're right, they don't, uh, as things are. And, and so we can continue to say, well, maybe we should force them to, or, or something like that, or talk about some happy future where, where everyone gets cited for it, but that's not the case. So then you have this sort of first, first mover issue. So instead, what I'd like to do is reframe the problem, which is how do we get platforms established that allow people to do what they want to do, which is science. Um, or if you're in a company, make money. So we need tools that allow people to achieve their goals. And if it's a side effect of that activity, they happen to be, becomes easy to share data. Well, that's fine, right? That's what you want. So what we need to focus on is creating the tools that allow people to say, upload their data. Uh, to a platform so they can do machine learning on it, so they can do analysis, so they com can combine it with another data set, et cetera. Uh, once they can do that, uh, oh, by, by the way, to do that, you need to curate your data in the following way, et cetera, and then you've made a deal with us that you then are making that data public after some embargo period or whatever. Um, so you can sort of see that that's the way the future should work and will work. Uh, and that's, I think, the bridge to the future. In terms of, uh, you know, what, what we're going to do over the next 10 years in a practical sense, well, we're going to use it to address true global challenges. We have no choice, right? There are a number of crises that we're facing, and, uh, you know, particularly climate, uh, energy production in general, uh, issues around the environment, circular economy, uh, things can address and we like to talk about these things, but we, you know, I think it's gonna be talk about all hands on deck. Uh, I don't think we have much choice. And so uh, in terms of what materials problems we need to address, I have a feeling we have a pretty good idea uh, where a lot of our intellectual energy is gonna go. Excellent. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about US federal agencies and the funding levels for MGI. Uh, where do you see that going in the near and, uh, and the longer term? Um, and this is obviously of great interest to, to a typical researcher. So you're asking me to tell you what I think Congress is gonna do? Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, right. So everyone should take, you know, what I'm about to say with an enormous grain of salt, uh, because I don't know. Uh, certainly this, you know, the president's budget this year for the science agencies in these areas was excellent. Uh, so for the 22. And so hopefully we'll see legislation um, that reflects that. It currently seems to be uh, where uh, Congress is headed this year. Uh, and I would be very surprised uh, if uh, that were to change. Uh, certainly even in years where uh, in the last administration, the administration's proposals for the agencies was very low, Congress didn't let that happen. Um, so even though it was significantly flatter, uh, we didn't see uh, a significant reduction. Right? And so, you know, with this administration being even 
more inclined to raise the budgets of the agencies and MGI still being a strong focus, I think you can expect that uh, MGI will be very healthy. You know, be, these particulars are very hard to predict. Uh, each agency needs to sort of sort out what their priority list is. But again, as I said, nobody is saying, well, MGI, that's last decade. We're now going to do materials in a completely different way. I, I think if anything, you're going to see how do we fuse these ideas into more of our programs. And at some point, you just maybe you say you don't need MGI because that's the only game in town. Uh, but right now, the only other major materials initiative is the nano initiative. And as much as I love the nano initiative, this is the MGI in some sense is everything, right? And so in that sense, it's a catch all for a lot of the materials work uh, that's getting funded. And, uh, you know, we welcome all comers in this space. Very good. Um, now, a good percentage of the MRS membership resides outside the United States. And obviously materials research does not happen in a vacuum. A lot of collaborative work uh, that goes on. So while MGI is a US initiative, it's clearly impacted materials research more broadly, I think. Um, and so I just wanted to get your thoughts on what the effects on and implications are for the global materials research community you know, through MGI? Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the great things about being part of the initiative and one of its effects has been that the global community has to a certain extent set up their own efforts in, in you know, along similar lines, uh, you know, including China, which had a materials genome engineering effort, which I believe is still in existence. Um, but, and they have their own institutes, but, you know, across Europe, they have similar efforts uh, in, you know, in the whole data management infrastructure, the science data clouds, uh, and in this same kind of materials uh, research, right? And as I was saying before, it's not just all hands on deck in the United States, it's really worldwide. So to the extent that we're talking about the, say, academic piece of this, the MGI, in some sense, is just a set of modalities to collaborate better. Uh, and to the extent that we're talking about industrial stuff, well, then it gets more complicated because of intellectual property. Uh, but it's certainly in the asymmetric sense that industry can now benefit more easily from the global academic effort. Um, that's a big piece. Uh, and then hopefully we're also devising modalities that can be set up inside you know firewalls or whatever sort of it infrastructure that you need to protect your information uh, and then using exactly those same techniques along your supply chain or whatever it is uh, that the mgi is developing uh, for a, in a more open access kind of a modality so there's nothing specific to the mgi that is uh, hostile towards existing business models per se uh, some people sort of hear the sharing stuff and they think that it's somehow, uh, you know, some plot to undermine existing <laughs> business models. And, and it's really not. I mean, I mean, arguably, there is some disruption. I mean, we're in the business of it. And so we might make it so, yeah, if it's a lot easier to make this material, then somebody would, you know, not be able to make a lot of money in some other space. But, you know, that's science. Uh, but beyond that, all we're trying to do is lower barriers to the use of and creation of knowledge. Uh, and that, you know, it's really hopefully gonna help a lot. And, you know, we have a lot of efforts that range from working with the largest high-tech companies to talking with, uh, say, uh, efforts to use locally sourced materials to, in, you know, in uh, sort of underdeveloped countries uh, where they can actually use, recycle that stuff and, and manufacture with it. Uh, using the same kinds of MGI databases. So, you know, there's, it's, it's everything and the incentives are different in each of those cases and they're all super important. Very good. Um, I'd like to close by asking you, what can a professional society set a, such as MRS, what can we do to support all of the efforts uh, around MGI in the context of the larger materials community and materials research? That's, I mean, there's so much, right? Um, and boy, this is a conversation we should keep having. Uh, so the, you know, the materials community 
is not monolithic. And even to the extent the MRS represents a lot of uh, researchers, myself included, right? There are so many material societies. Uh, and if there's one thing we're not great at, in my opinion, it's speaking with a relatively unified voice about what we need to do. And some of the problems that we're talking about are rather grand. Um, and they're going to take us deciding on what our priorities are in a certain sense. That's why I was sort of talking about uh, these sort of community-driven activities as being crucial. Uh, and so I, I view the MRS as an incredibly important potential voice on behalf of their membership to sort of organize, uh, to say, okay, well, these are the priorities. How do we get these platforms I was talking about to a place where the, the membership wants to use them, for example. Uh, you know, how, how do they get their research more easily inserted into manufactured products? You know, make, get, tr transit that valley of death, so to speak. Um, I think the MGI is in a position to really help with that. And I think the MRS is, can help uh, clarify, you know, where the, the gaps are in a way that is very hard in general for any single set of individuals to properly do. And so we're certainly uh, in the government uh, counting on the participation uh, of professional societies like MRS uh, to sort of be partners as we go forward with this. Certainly our strategy involves the active and enthusiastic participation of the community. This is not something coming from down on high. This is uh, almost a collaboration. That's very good. And um, on that note, I'd like to thank you, Jim, very much for talking with me today. And we, I'm sure we will continue to talk uh, about how this initiative continues to move forward and, and maybe talk again uh, in another 10 years when MGI completes 20 years, perhaps. So thank you again for talking with me. My pleasure. I'll see you when I'm 67. <laughs> uh, again, my name is Gopal Rao from the Materials Research Society. Uh, for more news, please visit the MRS Bulletin website at mrsbulletin.org. You can also follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at MRS Bulletin. Thanks again to Dr. Jim Warren, and thank you for listening.